Yeah, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to present here. Uh, and my talk is going to be about how we can use large-scale networks of molecular interactions uh, to identify ontologies of gene function. Um, so we all know that during the last 10 years, biology has really transitioned from what has largely been a single gene biology to modular biology, where we can study how genes and proteins interact with each other, uh, forming complexes and pathways. We can also study how these pathways function in key biological process, processes, including those related to human disease. Uh, but we all know that just as uh, the cell is not just a bag of genes, it's also not just a bag of complexes or pathways. Rather, it's a hierarchy where genes interact to form complexes and pathways. Those pathways themselves interact in higher order biological processes and ultimately giving rise to the entire cell and uh, living organism. Um, so hierarchies in biology, uh, we definitely have seen them around and, and there are examples of hierarchical models in biology and perhaps the most uh, best known example is actually the gene ontology uh, in which nodes represent uh, cellular components or biological processes or molecular functions, depending on which particular ontology we're looking at. And the edges in the ontology represent relationships between these uh, components. So perhaps part of or is a regulating relationships between components, processes, or functions. Uh, and now one characteristic that distinguishes Go from any of the models uh, that we have seen today and, and the other days of the conference is that Go is itself manually structured. So uh, it's developed by humans, by reading literature and identifying all the components that have so far been characterized and putting them into this hierarchy. Now the problem is that uh, while this is great for, uh, for categorizing what is already known, uh, this is not a way to, to get at the new biology, to, to discover new components and new processes and new functions. And so we ask whether we could use uh, large networks of molecular interactions, whether physical protein-protein interactions, uh, transcriptional networks, or uh, epistatic interactions, epistatic genetic interactions, whether we can use these large-scale maps that are available right now to try to construct an ontology directly from data that would actually enable us to identify new components and processes directly from data. And so we started with a simpler question, which is I try to, uh, to see whether these networks actually embed hierarchical structure that might be consistent with the gene ontology. So not yet reconstructing it, just to see if the information uh, might be there. So to to actually see whether or not to test this, uh, to test this hypothesis, uh, we mapped the genes um, from yeast uh, to the corresponding gene ontology terms from, from very specific small terms, almost single gene, or this is of course a, a simple illustration, but very small terms to larger terms up to very, very large terms, very general and broad. Uh, and then we looked at the interactions falling within those terms and between the terms and look at, you know, physical protein-protein interactions, genetic, epistatic interactions, co-expression, different types of interaction. Also this yeast network that sort of integrates a lot of the different interactions into one network. And we looked whether, uh, we looked at the density of interactions within, within the, these terms. Uh, so basically we're interested to see whether there's many more interactions within the terms that would be expected by chance. And in fact, this is the case. So for terms all from, from ranging from very small specific terms to very large terms, we see that the density of interactions within, this, within the networks is much higher than expected by chance or across the range. Uh, but we still consider the possibility that the interaction density in, in, higher, uh, in larger nodes, larger clusters, sorry, is due entirely to the fact that you know, very small, very dense clusters corresponding to protein complexes just have a lot of this density. And then if you have larger clusters, larger terms that contain the smaller ones, then the density is just you know, propagated from the smaller ones to the larger ones, where in fact you know, the interactions here between those small complexes might be placed at random. So again, to test that, uh, we devised a new method, a new random uh, network scheme where we preserved uh, you know, interactions falling between, within nodes of any given size, you know, from small, so here we, we are preserving small terms and looking at the next step, basically, and so on. So every time we preserve everything up to a certain size, and then we look, you know, how the density behaves in larger terms. And we see that, you know, whether that it is in fact the case that, you know, smaller terms actually do contribute some to the density of the larger terms, but really in the real network, you still get a lot more density. And that basically indicates that at any level of the hierarchy, if you go one step further, you still have a dense pattern of interactions connecting the smaller terms to form a larger term. And that indicates that the hierarchical information in the network is actually there and it's consistent with the gene ontology. So having established that, we then devised the method uh, 
a, a pipeline for, for constructing ontologies directly from network data and then comparing these ontologies uh, to the manually curated ontologies such as, the, such as the G ontology. And this pipeline consists of uh, basically three steps. Uh, the first starts uh, with this very nice probabilistic model for community detection that was published previously. And that method basically cons constructs a binary dendrogram from network data. So the leaves in this dendrogram are, of course, genes, and then any term connects, you know, first genes and then smaller terms to form larger terms and so on. Uh, the, the key characteristic here is that this is a binary tree, uh, ma mainly for computational reasons. It's just the complexity of the problem grows exponentially with the number of splits you consider. So you cannot, from the start, consider basically splits into more than two uh, children. But afterwards, uh, once you have this, you can actually, what we did is we designed a method that goes as a, as a second step and uses the binary tree as a guide and then goes in and asks, okay, what if we collapsed a number of binary splits to form multi-way splits? Does the probability increase, actually? Because this is a probabilistic framework, we can see that the probability of the model increases, perhaps, if some of the binary splits are substituted by the multi-way splits. And that's one of the key steps that we did here. And then another one is we looked at the network data to try to find support for additional parents. So that's a key characteristic of of Go and really the biology that any term might be, uh, might be part of not just one process but multiple processes. And so we tried to find these cases as well. And then finally, we developed a completely new method that uh, maps between the hierarchies to try to align them and see which components are conserved and which are different. And if you think about it, if you do it in a naive way using perhaps you know, one of the gene set enrichment methods that's available, the key problem that you always uh, run into is that one term maps to many different terms in the ontology. And if you do it really greedily and just try to pick the best one, you quickly run into problems where, you know, you, for instance, start with this one, map it here, and then here you have no way but just map it to another one. So that's a problem. So we have to design a method that basically considers both the, both the similarity of the gene set but also the structural similarity of the hierarchy. So that's what we did. So using this entire pipeline and using the entire collection of networks for yeast, uh, we basically constructed this uh, network extracted uh, ontology, Nexo for short, uh, and this is basically it. Uh, this is just showing the tree backbone for simplicity. It doesn't show the additional parents that we also identify. Um, and what we see basically uh, here in this tree version, every uh, uh, yeast gene is represented as a leaf, and then every internal node is a component, uh, uh, you know, basically containing multiple genes. Here's the root of this ontology, and here are, you know, uh, uh, various components uh, along the way. So the root splits into the membrane, the mitochondrial region, the intracellular region. Uh, and you can really uh, look at this as a, as a fractal representation of, of the cellular components. Uh, and, and you can really identify, you know, different uh, uh, splits, as, as such as in the ribosome and so on, that really have this, this hierarchical nature within them. Uh, and, of course, here's our alignment uh, score. So we, because we have this alignment to go, we can identify in the, the names of the components. So we can identify you know, the descriptions in English, basically, uh, of, of each of the components. And of course, some of the components are unaligned. And those are very interesting. Those are the new ones, potentially, that we might be able to, to verify and test and put into the ontology. This is basically the new biology that we might ident identify. And so just to show you a quick example of this, of this hierarchy, how it looks for a specific component, perhaps a textbook example of, of a hierarchical component is the proteasome complex, where you see it splits into the core and the regulatory particle that itself splits into the core. You know, the core splits into uh, the beta subunit and the alpha subunit, and the regulatory particle is, is splits into the base subcomplex and the lid subcomplex. So li really this uh, multi-scale hierarchical structure that's completely not visible in this, in this hairball representation. So we're also, we do agree that the hairball is not the best way to look at networks and really, you know, we suggest that that might be in many cases a better way to look at it. Um, so how does our Nexo compare to, to Go? Uh, in general, we find that around a third of the ontology that we found extracted from network data corresponds uh, to the Go, whether to biological process, cellular component, or molecular function. Uh, so, you know, two-thirds do not really correspond very well. Um, the, looking the other way, how much do we capture of Go? Around 60% of the Go cellular component, around a quarter of biological process and molecular functions we are actually able to identify purely from network data. Um, and now, what can we do this, with this? So we looked at two different scenarios. So one thing, uh, if we identify a new term uh, from network data, uh, 
uh, what, what, what can we learn? How can we uh, you know, go about including that term uh, in, the, in the Go or, or actually uh, saying that it's a real term? Uh, so one case is if the information is not in Go, but you can actually find literature supporting that term. Uh, and we actually found a number of such cases uh, in the chromatin remodeling region of, of our ontology. Uh, so our ontology identifies a number of chromatin remodeling compo components, uh, including SWISNIF, RISC complex, where one, I know AD, and so on. And those are complexes that are also annotated in Go, as you can see. So the black boxes correspond to terms in Go, and the black arrows uh, correspond to relationships in Go. And then the, the blue ones are, are terms and relationships that our ontology suggests on top of those. So you can actually see in our ontology that SWI SNF and RISC complex are grouped under a, uh, under a common parent, which corresponds to SWI SNF family. And so is the case for INO80 and SWIR1. And this is actually a, a case where there is literature support for this, and it's well known that those are two separate families of chromatin remodeling complex, complexes. And we were able to actually, working with the Go editors, we were able to change the Go and put those new components in, as well as some of the new relationships. So we put a number of those cases in where we can find literature support because that's really what the Go ultimately needs. They won't trust us just by using the data. Um, so then there's other cases where we have new components that were not identified in literature. And so what do we do with those? Uh, so looking at high throughput ways of uh, trying to, to get additional support for our ontology, uh, we, we did a, a genetic interaction profiling screen uh, uh, centered around a subtree of our ontology uh, that corresponds to Golgi protein trafficking. What we found is very interesting that if we have new terms that are very specific, very small, the genes uh, uh, in those terms tend to be very highly correlated in terms of the genetic interaction profiles. When we look at a little bit larger terms, we see that the correlation is still uh, much larger than expected by, by chance, but it's sm but smaller than the correlation within very specific terms and so on. So we really have a hierarchy of genetic interaction correlation uh, profi uh, profile correlations that corresponds to the hierarchy that we identified uh, from other data sets. Um, so I think this is pretty nice. And then we also have a you know, number of new components that we can try to systematically validate using chemogenomic experiments. So these are basically experiments that knock out each, systematically knock out each gene in yeast under different conditions and try to see if that gene might be essential under a particular condition. And so here we have an example of a component, a new component that's annotated under the mitochondria. And this component, any of those genes are not annotated, not known to co-localize with the mitochondria. But all of them, interestingly, are essential to, to, for yeast to grow under treatment with mercury chloride, uh, which is a, a compound inducing oxidative stress. So that's very relevant to the mitochondria, and because all of, the, all of the genes are actually essential under the same condition, that might tell us that it's a relevant component. And of course, you, know, you need a lot more follow-up experiments to really verify that this is a complex and it actually is co-localized in mitochondria, which is what we're looking at right now. And a number of other new terms we were able to characterize as being essential under various conditions in yeast. Um, just quickly, my last slide. We also asked, you know, basically, uh, how is Go most often used today? And it's most often used for functional enrichment. So you have a new data set, new high throughput data set, you want to validate that data set. You have a new experiment, you want to validate that experiment. And so you can use Go for this, but you can also use our ontology that's completely data derived and has the advantage of having new components that might have not been in Go. And so we find that actually, you know, we can identify uh, the same or more uh, cases where, where we find an enriched term under different biological conditions. So the power is pretty much the same or a little bit even better from the network extracted ontology compared to Go. And so this is my summary slide. Uh, so we think, uh, you know, of course, as, as everybody else uh, agrees probably to this, uh, the cell is not a bag of genes, but it's also not a bag of, of pathways or complexes. It is a hierarchy, and that hierarchy is pretty well represented by ontologies, which we can now extract from data. Um, these ontologies rival Go in terms of power of identifying uh, functional relationships. Um, and we can really try to now go about constructing automatically ontologies and refining these ontologies using data sets as they come up. So using new data sets and identifying new components to try to uh, systematically uh, get to a better, more complete uh, cellular model. I'd like to thank Trey uh, my postdoc mentor, uh, and 
uh, Michael Kramer, who worked on this project from, from Trey's lab, uh, Nevin Krogan and Michal Surma, uh, who were involved in the genetic interaction profiling, and Michael Cherry and Rama Balakrishnan helped us a lot uh, working with the Go editors uh, to try to change Go using data. Uh, thank you very much. Questions? I have a quick question. Uh, actually, two questions. So one is how you determine the size of your clusters. So, when, so this is the first question. And okay. the second question is that when you are clustering uh, to get these modules, is the objective function to maximize the density within each cluster? Okay. Um, so basically, uh, so, so the first question is how do we determine the size of the cluster? So we don't really determine the size of the cluster for, per se. Uh, I mean, the model is, I mean, basically we're optimizing one probabilistic function uh, to try to c come up with a dendrogram first. Uh, first, first a binary dendrogram and then we allow for this multi-way joins. Uh, but basically it's just one, opt one global optimization, so we don't optimize the particular cluster for size or anything like that. Um, the second thing relates to um, just the density of the cluster, so it's, uh, it's both. It's really, uh, you can think more, I think more appropriately, uh, of course, you know, it's a little bit more complicated, so we can speak uh, offline, but basically you can think of it as, as finding the, uh, these complicated model that explains you know, that captures the interactions both folding within clusters and across clusters. So if you have bundles of interactions, which is sometimes the case, you have bundles of interactions from one cluster to the next, you also want to put genes so that, you know, you, you basically capture all, uh, this bundle in one edge almost, and it doesn't, you know, uh, split into many different clusters. Um, so it's not, it, it does consider the density within clusters, but also the density between clusters as well. Uh, hi, it's a very nice talk. Uh, I'm not sure whether I understand it correctly, but to mention that you integrate the uh, um, evidence of network from transcriptional and physical interactions and uh, genetic network. So when you integrate those networks, there might be edges that are uh, different from different evidences. So how, how do you integrate them? Yep. Um, so basically, uh, I mean, the simple answer is that basically we we upgraded ESnet. So ESnet uh, has been um, published uh, around 2008, if I cor remember correctly, and that's a basically a, you know, a, a Bayesian integrated network uh, using, using a, a straightforward Bayesian framework. Uh, and the only thing about that is, is that some of the experiments, uh, like for instance, the, uh, the East genetic interactions, large-scale experiments were not available at that, at that time that we wanted to put in. So we basically updated that data set. So it's pretty much a, a Bayesian uh, integration uh, of, of the various data types. So right now, and that's an interesting question just uh, by itself because we're also interested in how the different types of data support different components in this ontology. So we definitely see cases where you know, there are some components and some sub-hierarchies that are almost entirely due to physical protein-protein interactions, whereas there's some other parts of the ontology are entirely supported only by the genetic interactions, for instance. And so we think that, you know, maybe looking at how the different types of data support different uh, substructures and maybe different biological processes versus cellular components and so on, uh, you know, we can refine this further. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker. <laughs>